Hey there, thanks for tuning in to this Paideira talk. My name is Massimiliano and I'm speaking to you from the Netherlands. I'm currently a data scientist at TomTom, which is a location navigation and map technology company here. Uh, but in a previous life, I was a physicist and a mathematician. And so there's still a little bit of mathematician in me. And I love finding out about some, you know, new little tools or uh, different ways of explaining things, uh, you know, from the life of a data scientist. And today I'd like to uh, tell you about one of these tools that I came across some time ago. And I also managed to apply a couple of times. Uh, this is called quantile regression, I guess, no surprise, because that's the, uh, that's the title here today. Um, but what I was surprised about is that it doesn't seem to be so well known in the machine learning or data scientist communities, even though it could be really useful. Um, so when we're finished today, I hope to have given you enough information or of an impression to recognize the situations in your work where some of these techniques are applicable. Um, so it's mostly about getting uh, some level of intuition and understanding what this is for, what it's all about, and not necessarily to understand every detail about it. So in other words, I hope that at the end, you know what quantile regression is, that it exists, and you might have some feeling of when to try it out. Now, to ease you in, we'll start with a hypothetical situation. So let's say I'd like to sell a house, but I do not know anything about real estate. So in particular, I have absolutely no idea about prices. You know, how much should I try to sell it for? Uh, I would be terrible at the negotiation without any information. So I need a broker. So I go to a broker and I say, hey broker, how much should I expect to get if I put my house up for sale? And they might say something like, well, a place like yours will usually go for around 180K. Um, all right, so they're saying something like a place like yours. So they're taking something into account about some aspect of my place, maybe the area or the type of, type of house. And they're saying, will usually go for around. So that can mean a lot of things. That's kind of ambiguous, uh, but probably it means something like, you know, an expected value with the like yours being some size or something. Um, so probably it's some kind of expected value. But wait, do I just want to get an average price or do I want to get a really good deal? So if I sell, I want to make as much, of course, as possible. So I might phrase it differently. Okay, so what would be a great deal? So like, wh what, should, what should I be really happy if I manage to uh, sell it for that? Um, and they might say something like, and I would hope that they would phrase it something like this, although that's probably not very, very realistic. They could say something like a house like that sells for less than 200K about 90% of the time, or equivalently sells for more than 200K about 10% of the time. Okay, so what does this really mean, right? So there is a part of a house like that. So there is some, some taking into account some aspects of this house, so some features. And then there is something about 90% of the time it goes for less than 200K. So that is a, a statement about percentiles or quantiles. Those are the same thing, by the way. So these are used interchangeably. So if I manage to sell it for 200K, that's a good deal for me. All right, how good? 90th percentile good. Right, so it's kind of grading on a curve. Okay, let's say that uh, our broker was very mathematical um, or that they had some kind of model to back them up. How could they get to such a number? All right. So to think about that, let's start with the situation where we know absolutely nothing yet about the house. So we don't know how big it is. We don't know what kind of house it is then what is the best we can do? Well, the best we can do is basically the naive thing, which is just plotting a histogram and looking at the shape of the distribution. And the thing we can say, well, 90% of houses in general sell for less than 280,000. All right, so that is a quantile statement, right? So it's a, it's a statement about the 90th quantile. You, you can plot it here in this, uh, in this uh, purple line. But that's pretty lousy. 
Because look at all those mansions there on this long tail. These are really expensive houses. You, you know, probably these houses are just really big or something, and that's why they're selling for more or they're in a really good location. So you might think, okay, let's see if we can break this down by the type of house. Now, what if my house, my house is a duplex? Then I might want to know, you know, uh, what is the price such that 90% of duplexes sell for less than that number? Now, that's exactly what a box plot does, right? So a box plot is, uh, is, a, is a plot to plot categorical values against some uh, continuous variable and to get some visual inspection about quantiles for lots of different types at the same time. Okay, by the way, worn out, uh, watch out. Uh, there is not really a uniform definition of what these whiskers, so these, these little balls at the end, should really mean. Um, but you can use this uh, to, to set it, for example, the, the end of the whiskers at 90th percentile, and then you can read off, all right, if it's a two-family two house, for example, you can expect to get this much, and in 90% of the cases, it will be less than this amount. All right, that's already a lot better than what we had previously. But it's still not that great because you can see here that there is still, you know, it's not that much information. The spread basically, it's very big. And, you know, uh, there could be an, another correlation with some other aspect. For example, it's well known that size matters in the pricing of real estate. So what about the size of the house? Well, one way to measure the size of the house is, of course, the, uh, the area of the living space. And you can, let's say, let's just start by plotting the continuous variable against the continuous variable of the area, so the square footage or square meters, against the price that the house sold for. Initially, I wouldn't even be really clear about how to formulate the equivalent of this 90% of the places sell for less than blah, blah, blah. Uh, it would be something vague, like 90% of the places with a similar surface area where similar is not well defined. So you would need to do some boxing, um, sorry, some, some, some grouping there. How should you formulate it? Well, I guess the first thing people would do is just draw a line through it, you know, using a regression, but that doesn't really get you that far because it doesn't tell you about the, the, the variance part there. Uh, unless you explicitly also take that into account. And in a lot of cases, um, it, this is not really the right thing to do. So we want to have something that is specific about the quantiles conditional on the area. Now, even though it's not so clear how to phrase the question, the answer you already know should look something like this, like this purple line here. So I don't know what the question is, but the answer is going to look like this line. Because when you expect here, inspect here, for example, a, a house of an area of 2000, I think this is in square feet, uh, then the uh, average or the expected price that it sells for is, is this here, and the uh, 90th percentile is here. And you can see that about 10% of the similar houses will lie above here and 90% will lie below the line here. Okay, so that is roughly what we mean. That brings us to the actual topic. And that is the mathematical way of asking the right question there that ends up drawing that purple line. So how do you draw this line? What does this line mean? And I think also pretty importantly, how do I not do this just for one feature like the area, but how do I do it for a bunch of features at the same time? Maybe even non-linearly or you know, something fancier if I want to. Now, this whole example, of course, was made up, but there are also some real applications of this uh, of this way of thinking in literature. And this whole this whole area started out in economics and social sciences, where, for example, one of the uh, one of the things to look at there is uh, food spent versus income. Uh, so this is something that already uh, Karl Marx uh, and uh, Engel were doing. Uh, you can you know, you, you see that there is this heteroscedastic effects of uh, the variance in the food spend not being constant in the income. 
for example, not even if you take log linear scales in both. And so similar techniques can be used to look at unemployment rates or what I think is a nice hypothetical example, I haven't seen it in uh, literature, is thinking about student potentials. So given the background of a student, so for example, maybe something about socioeconomic status, which is known to, to have a big influence in what you can expect, but also maybe previous grades or some other conditions to see if you can uh, identify what is the maximum potential of a certain student and maybe reward them if they, if they are going above that or something like that. Of course, I'm not saying anything about the ethics of that, but you can imagine doing something like that. Now, what is also found in the literature is demand forecasts. And I think this is the first place where it showed up in a more serious way, uh, where I'm expecting it's making some money somewhere. And uh, this is in the energy sector. So uh, there is a whole industry of predicting supply and demand for uh, managing a grid. Because what you need to do is to know about the peak loads that might happen. So the peak demand, for example, to plan your supply. So you need to forecast demand in order to uh, create supply or the other way around if you want to set prices. Uh, and if you want to do this and manage risk, you need to know about things like, all right, so 99% of the time I want to overestimate. Otherwise, I will have a shortage of, electric of, of power. So statements that you can get then are related to that risk, which makes it then quantifiable, right? So at the 99th percentile, this means you will underestimate 1% of the time. So if this is an hourly forecast, it's once every 100 hours, you might have not enough energy. All right. But minimizing the wasted capacity, All right? So this is a constraint, kind of a constraint uh, optimization problem. Now, just nice to note that there is some open benchmark data set. Um, and that is what a lot of papers were based on. And it turned out that uh, when it comes to demand forecast of electricity, some neural net methods that work with this quantile regression um, sort of work quite well for this. And it gives you a whole kind of a lot of non-parametric uh, information about the distribution of this demand. Now, the last example I want to highlight is called is wallet estimation. And that's quite similar to what we talked about with the house prices. So IBM noticed that they had a lot of data about uh, what the, the sizes of deals that they had with different uh, clients. But their sales team knows that when you know in a negotiation what the potential spend is, so for example, the entire IT budget of a company, you're in a much better position to negotiate because you know, you know what is the ceiling. Now you can imagine the only thing you observe in the data is what people actually spend and what you want to know is the potential spend. So this is a one place to apply this quantile regression. So thinking about, for example, the 80th percentile of spend. All right, enough about applications. Now show me some mathematics. So let's put this quantile regression into context uh, by contrasting it to some things that might be more familiar. And I think the most familiar to people will be ordinary least squares, which is here all the way on the left. Um, and what ordinary least squares does is the least squares, right, is minimizing the squared error loss. That's one way of defining it. But what is really the goal? What is this thing estimating? It is estimating the conditional mean, right? So F here me is the, um, uh, is the uh, distribution density. And we have conditioned here this distribution on the value of the features. So for example, the uh, features of the house, so the area and the type of building. And then we want to know something about the conditional mean. So expected value of the output of this. All right. So that's called L2 regression also sometimes. Now L2 regression, you shouldn't be confusing with L2 regularization. So please uh, keep that in mind. But it feels a little bit arbitrary because why this squared loss? It doesn't really seem like the thing you would naturally want to minimize. And something like 
the difference of the absolute value seems a little bit more natural to some people. And in fact, there is such a thing that's called MAE or L1 regression. And it's sometimes also called, you know, the regression that's robust to outliers. Um, but to make that more precise, actually, you can show that minimizing this MAE is the same as or implies estimating the conditional median. So this notation here is a little bit more complicated, but this capital F here is the cumulative distribution function. Then you invert that. So that means if you invert the cumulative distribution function, what goes in is kind of a probability threshold. And what comes out is a value in the domain of Y, which is your output value of a model, right? So that's a little bit complicated. But so inverse of that, uh, evaluated at one half because the median is uh, is the, the, mid the middle of the value. So it's the value of Y such that half the values are going to be below that. Okay. Now we are finally ready to say what quantile regression really is. And that is estimating the conditional quantile. So we take this same inverse of cumulative distribution function. So conditioned on feature X, and we try to find the value at alpha, where alpha is some value between zero and one. So for example, alpha is 0 0.9 is trying to find the 90th percentile or the good deal. Okay. Then we need some kind of equivalent here for the loss function. So what is the equivalent here? Well, since this is a generalization of this, also the pinball loss probably should be a generalization of the MAE error. So let's see what we can do there. Um, we want to generalize this here, the mean absolute error. And if you plot that, that is this here, right? So it's X equals X and it's uh, the opposite here on this side. And the idea here is to take that plot and take a different penalty for overestimation and underestimation. And that boils down to tilting it one way or the other. And you can see that here in the plots. So for example, estimating the 75th percentile, it's the same as tilting it, uh, is tilting this graph this way and applying this loss function. So if you want to write that out, uh, in sort of case notation, it looks like this. You can also do it using indicator function, for example. So different penalty for over and under estimation. That's the basic idea. And that's called pinball loss. It's also sometimes called tilted loss because you're taking the loss and tilting it. Now that's nice. That's the definition, but that doesn't tell us that it's going to work. So how do we know that this is the right thing? Well, what does it even mean to do the right thing there? So what I want to see is what does minimizing this loss function have to do with finding the quantile? We want to show some kind of equivalency. And one way sort of ignoring the conditional part is to formulate it like this. So we have a minimization part here on the left and we have this inverse conditional uh, distribution function on the right. So we want to say basically mathematically that minimizing expected value of certain loss is actually finding this thing. Okay. Well, you can sketch a proof like this. So it has a, a, it has a couple of steps. Um, maybe it looks a little uh, intimidating to people who are not uh, used to this type of thing, but the ingredients are really not so bad. So there is a couple of ingredients here and they have to do with, uh, you know, uh, things like uh, this uh, distribution theory and uh, Leibniz rule, product rule, a couple of things like that. And I think it's not really appropriate for uh, for this conference talk. So if someone wants to talk about that, we can do that in the Q&A and I'll be happy to, uh, to, to explain the steps. But let's instead go for an easier route. We'll go proof by picture of a special case. And the special case, very conveniently, is the mean absolute error, which we said earlier is supposed to find you the median. Okay, how can we see this? Let's say I want to take the elevator and there's a bunch of elevators in a row and I'm not sure which one will come first. I'm lazy, so I want to minimize the distance that I walk to these elevators. 
where should I stand with respect to the elevators? Now, if there's two, it doesn't matter as long as I'm somewhere in between. Because no matter where I stand, um, uh, there's, of course, a one in two chance, because I don't know anything about how the elevators come, that I have to go to the one and to the other. So the sum of these is always going to be the same. Now, if there's three, if after you think about it for a while, it's actually, it gets more important where you stand. You should stand in front of that middle elevator. Okay. If there's four, again, it doesn't matter so much as long as I stand in between the two middle elevators. And you can hear now how this minimization problem of how long do I expect to walk is equivalent to standing in the middle of the, uh, uh, between the middle elevators. So that's the median. Okay. So that's a proof by picture of why this uh, um, me, uh, mean absolute error has to do with the median. All right, so we're curious now. We need to step out of the world of math and into the real world. So we need some kind of implementation to get numbers out. Uh, an easy way to do this is to use, for example, Python package of stats models or the R equivalent of that, if we want to use a linear version of this quantile regression. Um, you know, it's the original, it's where economics uh, uh, use these techniques. And in fact, it's also what I used to draw this purple lines in the housing example. But maybe we're not so happy with just linearity. We want to do something fancier with more, you know, more options, more tunability. And uh, we could go for some gradient boosting method because uh, a lot of the gradient boosting methods, what they mostly need is some kind of, you know, some kind of function that we want to minimize. Uh, with some conditions. And in fact, that's what scikit-learn and LightGBM do. They take just this pinball loss or a smooth or smoothen out version is also possible. And just a, a hand calculated uh, gradient and you can do your thing. Now, something similar will also work for neural nets and that's I'm going to show you in a bit, but there's a lot of other ways of doing it also. So for example, you can, ge you can generate tree methods or nearest neighbor methods, kernel methods. The basic idea for most of these is that you just use the, met the method for regression to find sort of the conditional distribution, and then you take a local quantile. There's also a really great trick in the literature about how to reduce this problem to classification problem, uh, but that is not uh, always uh, feasible. All right, so what if I want to use uh, TensorFlow or Keras to implement such a model, because for some reason, I think uh, that uh, gradient boosting is not going to be good enough, or maybe I have this uh, time series data or something. Turns out it's not so difficult. So this uh, implementation you see here, it's not super long, and the real meat is just in this line here, right? So we have y true minus y predicted, and then we have some kind of maximum and some uh, average, and that's it. Now it takes maybe a bit of thinking to see that this is equivalent to the other formulation, but it is. So that's not so bad, right? So this is e easy. And what is one of the benefits? It's actually that you can have multiple different quantiles of different outputs at the same time. So you can take a median, a 90th percentile, and a 99th percentile, all part of the same model, optimizing for them at the same time. The challenge then on the other hand becomes how to balance these uh, different outputs. That's always the case when you have multiple outputs in one model, because there's you can always only minimize one thing. So probably you can take the sum or a weighted sum. You have to think about it. Now, let's say we've made such a model. How do we evaluate it? Because there is one thing that is slightly trickier than with usual regression, and that is evaluation. So just like with the unsupervised methods, uh, it can sometimes be difficult to know how you're doing because you're not observing the value that you're actually predicting, right? So what can we do? Well, the first thing to do for sure is a sanity check because if we're saying that our model predicts 90th percentiles, we'd better only be, uh, we'd better only be under predicting uh, by 10% uh, or in 10% of the cases. But that cannot be the full story because that would mean 
that the population quantile would optimize, uh, would be the optimal solution to the problem. And that doesn't make sense. Um, so we also apply our usual uh, methods of train test validation, maybe some k-fold cross validation, to compare different versions of the model to see how much better one is against the other. Probably you still want to have some kind of evaluation of how fit for purpose is this model for whatever the thing you're trying to use it for. So you might also need some expert judgment, or some other things. And uh, another evaluation method is Winkler scores. Uh, we can talk about it in Q&A session if someone is interested in that. Well, I hope I gave you enough so far so that when you leave, you have at least the following. You can identify when, you know, if you're interested in some kind of potential value or risk, right? So you're making a prediction about extreme values or, you know, uh, some kind of grading on a curve. You know that at least one of the options you have is quantile regression. Now, the other thing I'd like you to take away is that when you're predicting bounds, and let's say you're not interested in this quantile regression directly, but if you're predicting something that sounds like a quantile, you have an evaluation method to compare two versions of your model, all else being equal, which one predicts the bounds best? And that metric is pinball metric. Okay, so that was all for me uh, for now. And uh, I hope to see you at the Q&A session. Uh, thanks and stay safe. Hey.